Hello and uh, welcome to this lecture. Uh, we are going to talk about continuous random variables. So, this is the first step uh, we are taking to a new subject, uh, new topic in this uh, study of statistics uh, that we are doing right now. Uh, so far, we have looked at discrete random variables and this uh, simple description using what is called the probability mass function. So, x usually takes values like you know 1, 2, 3, etc. and then you have the the PMF probability mass function probability that a random variable capital X equals small x is something and then we work with it, we understand something about the probability calculations etc. All of that uh, we have looked at, we have looked at multiple random variables, we have looked at so many different ideas. So, now we are going to start slowly moving towards uh, what is uh, this notion of a continuous random variable and this is very important because you will see quickly uh, the numbers can become very unwieldy and become very large if you want to stick to the discrete domain and then this uh, continuous uh, random variable domain is gives you very easy ways to deal with uh, these kind of situations. Okay? So, so let us get started, I will give you a description of why, why all this is needed and then uh, describe the main tools that are needed for uh, doing computations with continuous random variables. Let us begin with an introduction, in the introduction I am going to sort of motivate why uh, one uh, requires this kind of continuous random variables on where does it show up usually uh, when we look at data. Okay? So, of course, in theory one can build it in a very different way, uh, but I would like to start with some data and show how uh, this kind of a continuous view of you no know, random variables uh, helps us in uh, computations and uh, dealing with data, summarizing it, working with it, etc. So, so let us uh, let us think of our usual discrete random variables and let us say the alphabet in which it takes values is this script x, right. So, this other x and when, uh, when this uh, alphabet grows very large, uh, one sees immediately that it becomes a little bit difficult to work with uh, the discrete random variables. See, remember how did we deal with discrete random variables? We wrote down a big table of all possible values that the random variable could take and the probability with which it took the values. Now, when the number of values goes larger and larger and larger, we saw even the binomial distribution for instance, right. So, if, if you have a binomial with n equals 1000 and p equals 0 0.6, you are already getting to a point where you cannot make tables. You are starting to write down expressions, but then the expressions are also, you know, this is 1000 choose 500 p to the power 500. This is really difficult to sort of understand what these numbers are, where the probability is, etc. Everything becomes very unwieldy to deal with, particularly when the alphabet uh, grows large. So, let me give you two examples of uh, situations that can happen. The one situation I will show is uh, meteorite weights. I think uh, there is a spelling mistake here. So, let me see if I can fix that. You will see me making this mistake quite often, O and E replaced with E and O. Uh, so, I will do it here, maybe I will not do it in every slide you can treat both of them are the same. So, let us look at uh, meteorite weight. Okay? So, what are meteorites? Meteorites are objects that enter the earth and they are moving around in space and they hit the earth's atmosphere and they enter the earth, they are drawn by earth's gravity to come inside uh, the earth's atmosphere. Eventually, some of them even hit the ground and some of them you know completely sort of disintegrate in the atmosphere because of heat, etcetera. So, there is this calculation of uh, you know there is this uh, not calculation, there is this uh, data on what is the weight of the different meteorites that have actually landed on earth and the, uh, you know maybe hit the earth at some point in time or you know the, the various stages of you know how, how much uh, damage they cost etc. And this distribution is uh, spread over a wide range of weights. There is this 0 0.01 grams really tiny things that make their way in and then there is also on the other side 60 tons. Okay? So, the large weight ones are very rare. Uh, quite very, uh, you know, if, if you actually look at the data, there is 45,000 plus meteorites, you can go to many websites and download this data and if you look at their uh, weights, most of the weights are around a few kilograms, maybe even less than that, you know, 100 grams to 800 grams like that and a few of them will go into the tons and, and there is one or two which are in the tens of tons and very large, but uh, you know, out of this 45,000, very few are in that range. Now, if the meteorite hitting the earth is sort of like a random like phenomenon and if you want to think of you know doing statistical study of this uh, this phenomenon and you start looking at the data maybe starting to fit a model and a distribution to it. So, you notice now that the data is really vast, the alphabet is very large. So, you want to think of the meteorite weight as your random variable. Then uh, you have this uh, 
big uh, set of data to contend with 45,000 plus and uh, look at the range 0 0.01 grams to uh, 60 tons. Maybe the range is not too scary. We have other methods to deal with that. I will tell you how to deal with uh, when you have a large range, how to simplify that. But still 45,000 you know, uh, entries in that and so many different values. You know, do, do you really gain any insight from it? Did you understand you know, which weights are more likely, which weights are less likely? I mean, it looks uh, really difficult to make anything uh, meaningful out of a statistical study of something like this if you are going to stick with discrete random variables. Maybe there is something simpler uh, we can do. Okay? Something very similar happens even with the binomial distribution. So, look, look, look at binomial n, p. If, if n is growing very large and p is a constant. So, this can happen a lot. right? So, if, if, if you look at Bernoulli trials, like you know incidence of a disease in a population or something, the population is very large and p is going to be a constant let us say and let us say maybe there is something like that. Then you know you have to really worry about uh, you know how to do these big calculations with you know combinatorics, combinatorial calculations right. So, this n choose k, p power k, 1 minus p pi n minus k when n is of the order of thousands and ten thousands and k is of the order of 5500 you know. What, what, what do you gain by that? I mean, everything is going to be this big number and you do not even get a sense of what where the probability is, is not it? So, maybe for the binomial, I know a little bit more, but still it will be nice to do, to be able to do calculations with the binomial distribution when n goes large also, right? So, how, how do you, is there a better way to do it? Is there a simpler way to do it? Uh, that is that's one of the interesting questions to ask. So, these are the kind of situations where uh, the notions of continuous random variables sort of directly in an easy way. Uh, enter the picture. So, when you expect the variable you are analyzing, the phenomenon you are analyzing to take a lot of values, okay, maybe in a small range, maybe in a large range, okay, the range really does not matter. When you take a lot of values and each of those values have different probabilities and you have to keep track of all of them, etc., you are better off thinking about continuous modeling. Okay. So, instead of modeling them as discrete, uh, model them as continuous and then there are tools from the world of continuous random variables uh, which you will need and uh, you can use them and you can do uh, simpler calculations with uh, that model. Okay? So, so this is uh, the core idea of when, when you have a lot of data and a lot of different values that the data takes you know, within the same range. Uh, you, for instance, you might want to think of weight of an adult uh, person. right? If you think of weight of an adult person, again uh, the value can range in, in kilograms, it can range maybe from 45 kg kgs to 120 kgs or something like that. And all the values, if you look at a large enough population, there's going to be so many weights, okay? And depending on the precision with which you measure, you can you can really get a whole bunch of values which are all different. And, and listing them out as discrete and keeping track of them, I don't know if you really gain any insights from it or you can do any calculations from it. Is there a simpler way to you know describe that uh, phenomenon of you know weight of an adult person, meteorite weight that is hitting the planet Earth, uh, binomial distributions and growth large? Is there a simpler way? to do calculations in, in those kind of statistical situations and uh, that is where continuous random variables enter the picture. Do you give up something? Yes, you do give up something. You, you give up some precision, uh, you know, if you keep track of everything, you have a lot of precision, but you know, but the calculation is really painful. So, maybe, maybe the, this trade-off is worth it. Okay? So, this is sort of background. I, I want you to remember this in mind uh, as we develop the theory. So, when we, when we start developing the theory and writing down those equations for, you know, distribution functions, density functions and calculations and integrations and all of that will enter the picture. It is uh, sometimes possible to lose track of these kind of ideas, but these kind of ideas are very useful in the modeling. So, how do you go from data to a continuous model? Uh, it is, this is the motivation, you know. So, you have a much simpler description in the continuous world. Okay. So, so let me give a little bit more data on uh, this meteorite situation. Was, uh, this illustrates a few things which I thought were very interesting at this point to get to know. Okay. Uh, so, if you actually look at the data, I, I will make the data available to you uh, in a suitable format. It is 45,000 plus uh, rows of an Excel file. There is lots of data on the meteorites. One of the data is the weight in grams and the range of the data is from 0.01 to 60 tons. I think that is 6 followed by how many of us zeros to make 60 tons. So, when you have a wide range like this, one of the very interesting and simple transformations you can do which you have learnt in your mathematics 1 course is uh, taking logarithms. So, if you take logarithms even to base 2 for instance here like I have done, uh, you will get a different range and that range will suddenly start looking very small. Okay? 
and uh, not that you reduce the amount of data, you still have the 45,000 plus data, but at least the, you know, the numbers you're dealing with are small, you know, from minus 6.6 .6 to 25.8 instead of 0 0.01 to 60 tons. It's difficult to plot that, it's, it's just too com confusing. But if you just look at minus 6.6 .6 to 25.8, you're already feeling better, right? So, so this kind, this trick of transforming the data uh, to make it fall into a certain range or a certain type of values that you like uh, is a very useful trick when you model data. You might want to keep that somewhere in the back of your mind as you go through your uh, other courses in data science, okay? So that's minus 6.6 .6 to 25.8. So this is one trick. It, it's not, it's got nothing to do with the continuous random variable stuff I'm going to talk about, but I think it's a useful trick uh, to remember. So we'll, in this data, it makes sense to take log. So we'll take log and look at everything in the log domain, okay? So here's the main idea that moves from discrete to continuous. It, it's sort of a bit uh, counterintuitive, it's a bit confusing. People always lose track of uh, these kind of ideas, but you know, it's uh, this. This is how continuous uh, enters the picture. This is the simplification, or uh, you know, you, this is how you you go from large amounts of data to a short description of it in the continuous domain. The main idea is to move away from focusing on individual values that your data is taking, individual values that the random variable is taking, but focus on intervals. Okay. So here is uh, what I would do here. For instance, uh, minus 6.6 .6 to 25.8. Maybe I want to divide it into 100 intervals. Okay, so maybe you will roughly get minus 6.6 .6 to minus 6.3, 6.3 to minus 6, so on till 25.5 to 25.8, okay. Now this 100 is something in my hand, I, I, can I can change this 100, I can make it 1000 if I want, I can make it 500, I can make it 25, I can make it whatever else I like. Uh, you can imagine in the continuous world, in the theory, you, you want to make that as large as possible and make these interval widths as small as possible, but you never get out of the interval stuff. I mean, it's always an interval. It's always, uh, you know, a bunch of intervals as opposed to individual values, okay? So that, that move from individual values to intervals is uh, very, very crucial when you go from discrete to the continuous world, okay? So, so that's something, you know, so you've got to remember this. Uh, when we, the main idea in moving, f moving towards the continuous world to have a model in the continuous world is to start thinking of intervals. And when you think of intervals, everything becomes uh, very, very easy, okay? So that's, uh, that's the first trick and the important trick and the main idea here, okay? So once you put bins or intervals, you can simply count how many times my val variable of interest fell in that bin, okay? How many times the log of the weight of the meteorite fell between minus 6.6 .6 to minus 6.3, okay? How many times did it fall between 25.5 to 25.8? I'll now keep track of these counts. Okay, so this is called uh, histogram. If you, if you do this, the term that people use is histogram. And these histograms are hopefully much better for you to describe and think about and visualize and picture and do calculations with than the individual values. And anyway, I can make these intervals quite small. You know, I mean, this is compared to the overall weight and these intervals are quite small and they do give me enough precision uh, to work with uh, this data. So this, this move uh, from discrete individual values to bins and counts of the values in the bins is a crucial idea that uh, get, moves into the modeling in the continuous world, okay? So once I do this, notice what happens, okay? So this is called a histogram of, uh, of any uh, data that you look at. So I'm going to look at histogram of log of weights and this is a picture I can draw, okay? So this picture, many, uh, many, uh, you know, uh, Computer programs will let you draw histograms in a very nice way. Uh, we will see as part of our uh, diploma course, we will see a, a clear way to you know, plot histograms, plot things like this. So it's that part of another course. But here I've plotted a histogram and these are the bins, okay? So on the y-axis here, you have uh, the count of number of values. So this is the count, right? So number of, this is the count that shows up here. And these are the bins on the x-axis, okay? So, for instance, you, you look at uh, look at a bin like, you know, something around 5, right? So, you see around 5 is where the maximum number of count uh, seems to appear, about 1,800, uh, 1,700 of them are around 5. And as you go towards the right, you know, above 15 and all is very less count, 100 and below. And in fact, very less also. I mean, if you go to minus 5 also, the count is really, really less. and goes all the way to 25, but the counts there are going to be really, really, really tiny compared to the 1800 and look at this picture. So you already see some sort of a, you know, easy picture to remember in your mind, right? I mean, somebody gives you 45,000 values spread out over a large range. It's very difficult. You take log and then you bin, 
you get this very nice and simple picture and it's, it's something nice to uh, describe. So, so, so instead of focusing on individual values, maybe it's simpler to build a continuous model where you focus simply on the shape of the histogram, put some modeling on the shape, you know, maybe it's some function of, you know, the continuous variable x and then you do that and then start doing calculations with that, right. So, remember we went from individual values to intervals. So, we will we'll have to be stuck with intervals. You, you, once you come to the interval, you cannot go back to the individual value again, right. So, you have lost that precision of the individual value. So, we will uh, focus on intervals and we will try to find probabilities that our variables fall inside intervals. And these intervals are small enough that they sort of are close enough to the maybe the individual values or maybe we that is enough for us, right. So, I mean wh what do you really gain by knowing the exact weight of the meteorite and I do not know, I mean, that is a different sort of study. Uh, for most people it is important that the meteorite is very big or very small, so intervals are good enough in some sense, right. So, anyway many of our measurements even weight if you measure our ability to measure has a precision, right. So, so you can go up to say milligrams, micrograms, I do not know whatever grams, very, very small precision, but you cannot really make the precision infinite, right. You cannot measure a weight up to as uh, precise as you want, there are fundamental limits there, right. So, so you can, you can only have a precision. So, any weight you measure, even though somebody gives you 0 0.01 grams, it is actually within a certain interval only. So, everything in the physical world is only within intervals. So, doing intervals is fine, you know, I mean, that is good enough, you do not need anything more. So, so yes, we do give up precision, uh, but you know, precision is never there beyond a certain point. So, as long as you can make your intervals very small, as long as you can increase your number of intervals, you do not really lose much, okay. So, that is the important thing, okay. All right. So, this was uh, motivation, introduction and uh, I want you to sort of carry this thoughts uh, into the theory. So, once we start building the theory, this will, this will seem very remote because the theory itself is a little bit more involved, you will have integration, you will have to do calculations which are a bit painful, you may feel scared about it, you may feel uncomfortable around it, uh, but the modeling is uh, more crucial. So, when, when you identify data, which is which, which kind of data do you want to quickly do a continuous model for, for what you do not want to do a continuous model, things like that uh, should easily uh, be assimilated when you look at data, okay. So, having with that introduction, uh, okay, so this is one final piece of introduction also. So, here is the, here's the um, uh, you know the PMF of binomial distribution n equals 100. So, this is the PMF. So, even here when you plot the PMF even though we cannot do the calculations that easily, you see that there is a nice shape, right. You see this nice shape. So, maybe if you give up the precision of the individual values and just focus on the shape and come up with some other model, even for the binomial maybe we will gain a lot, right. So, that is something uh, that is very interesting and binomial like I said shows up quite often in Bernoulli trials and all that. So, these kind of calculations, ability to do easy calculations with binomial distribution. So, for instance, suppose I asked you in this PMF, what is the probability that the binomial random variable falls between 50 and 60, okay. So, if you have to do accurate calculation, you have to do 100 choose 50 times, you know, p power 50, 1 minus p power, 100 minus 50 plus 100 choose 51. Look at the calculation, it is just so unwieldy, right. I just need to know what is the probability that the binomial random variables falls between 50 and 60. Is there an easier calculation? Can I do something easier? I am willing to give up precision. I do not want the exact answer. I am within something is good enough for me. And uh, is there a simpler method, right? So, so can we do something easier here? All of that comes because of continuous random variables. It is a very nice uh, theory out there uh, which gives you uh, these tools, okay. So, calculations with PMF in the binary uh, binomial case is very tough and uh, maybe there are simpler alternatives, okay. So, let us keep this introduction in mind as we jump into the next section which will talk about a very important thing called the cumulative distribution function.